My dear friends, uh, when I was invited to speak in this uh, Congress about family life, I was surprised why I was invited. <laughs> because I was never invited in, uh, to speak, uh, to speak in uh, family life meetings or congresses. But then uh, I said, uh, I think the only reason why they invited me is because I will be the incoming <laughs> chairman of the Commission on Family Life of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. And the people that are very active in the Family Life Apostolate would like to see how I look. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, I was asked to speak about pro-life advocacy, its urgency in our present society. My talk will not be long. In this talk, I will focus on why it is urgent that we work hard so that the House Bill 4244, or the so-called Reproduction Health Bill, will not be passed by Congress and the Senate. We will also explain and refute the ideas on which those who are in favor of this House Bill 4244 base themselves. In this talk, I will deal more on the theological, moral aspects of the issue, not on the legal or medical aspects. As Archbishop Palma said in his homily yesterday, he said, you know, regarding legal uh, things, and also medical uh, things, the lay people are more knowledgeable than we priests. No? So I opted to speak more about uh, theological and moral aspects where I think priests are allowed to, to talk about, to speak. But before anything else, I would like to remind ourselves of the broader or complete meaning of pro-life advocacy. No? Because sometimes we tend to just take it in the uh, narrow uh, meaning. No? We should uh, defend and promote life from the womb to the tomb in all stages of life. No? Here I would like to quote lengthily from the encyclical letter of Blessed John Paul II, Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, no? number three. It's a bit long, but uh, it really uh, expresses uh, very much and uh, will explain what I would like to say. Every individual, precisely by reason of the mystery of the word of God was made flesh, is entrusted to the maternal care of the church. Therefore, every threat to human dignity and life must necessarily be felt in the church very hard. It cannot but affect her at the core of her faith in the redemptive incarnation of the Son of God and engage her in their mission of proclaiming the gospel of life in all the world and to every creature. Today this proclamation is especially pressing because of the extraordinary increase and gravity of threats to the life of individuals and peoples especially where life is weak and defenseless. In addition to the ancient scourges of poverty, hunger, endemic diseases, violence, and war, new threats are emerging on an alarmingly vast scale. The Second Vatican Council, in a passage which retains all its relevance today, forcefully condemned a number of crimes and attacks against human life. Thirty years later, taking up the words of the Council, and with the same for for forcefulness, I repeat that condemnation in the name of the whole Church, certain that I am interpreting the genuine sentiment of every upright conscience. Whatever is opposed to life itself, such as any type of murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, or willful self-destruction, whatever violates the integrity of the human person, such as mutilation, torments inflicted on body or mind, 
attempts to coerce the will itself. Whatever in insults human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, as well as disgraceful working conditions, where people are treated as mere instruments of pain rather than as free and responsible persons, all these things and others like them are infamous indeed. They poison human society and they do more harm to those who practice them than to those who suffer from the injury. Moreover, they are supreme dishonor to the Creator. Now, why I do why do I stress this? Because uh, you know, uh, some Catholics and many Catholics, uh, even Catholics and even priests and nuns, no, say this something like this. Because once I was eating uh, beside a nun, uh, and uh, we talk about the RH's uh, bill, no. And she said, uh, Bishop, why is it that the bishops are moving uh, heaven and earth, no? Just to oppose this, uh, our spirit is just about contraception. And she does not know the whole RH bill, no? Uh, about contraceptives, that some of them are about the fashion. And contraception is just uh, preventing life, and uh, illegal, well, immoral means of illegal life. Well, the bishops are silent about about the oppression, about the injustice, about the other evils in society. And I also read that once in a column of a priest who said, "Why is the we call it institutional church? The bishops are moving who behave on earth of, uh, to, uh, to uh, oppose this uh, bill about contraception, and they are silent about uh, injustices in the Philippines." Well, I told her, you know, that's not right, no? The bishops have been always also protesting against injustices, trying to help people who are oppressed, and uh, about the squatters and so on, so many things. We have written so many pastoral letters, in fact, in fact too many. In fact, I said, uh, uh, working for justice, for those who are ready, alive, no? they say, why don't you give more attention to those who are alive and try to put all your uh, efforts in preventing, well, of course it's wrong, no? but for those who are not yet alive. You know? Well, I said, you know, even in martial law, we, sometimes the priests and the nuns are even uh, exaggerating no? during martial law. Because I know some priests and nuns who became uh, members of the NPA, commanders, and so on, because of that... Uh, idealism of, you know, wanting to help the, the poor. No? And of course, the bishops have been so many letters. Well, Cardinal Sin uh, helped in that uh, Edsa one and all this. So it's not true. No? And uh, also, they are saying in the world that they say that the church is about against quantums, no? Why so much? And it's because of that, they are causing so much uh, the spread of AIDS. No? But if you look at it in the world, among those who are working, the private uh, entities who are working for AIDS victims, the one that uh, works most is the church. So it's not true that the church is just uh, uh, concerned about doctrine and so on. It's really helping. It's really helping. It's more those columnists who are not doing anything, who are very good in talking, but not doing anything. So that's it. Yeah, and then also, at the same time also, I say this, to remind ourselves also, no? Let us not just have our attention on this, you know, about contraception and so on. Let us also think about the other injustices, other than offenses against life around us. And that's what the Holy Father is saying in his, uh, you know, Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. In that very letter, where he is uh, protesting against uh, uh, contraception and so on, abortion, he is stressing that these are not the only evils, but uh, there are so many other evils which the Church is also very much against. Now, the paragraphs that follow in this same encyclical letter 
are concerned with the pro-life advocacy in its narrower sense. And I think that's what the meaning we usually give in our meeting, no? In pro-life, like pro-life advocacy, and in this talk that was assigned to give its urgency in our present society. The paragraphs that follow in the same encyclical letter are concerned with the pro-life advocacy in its narrower sense. And this is the meaning of the deep to pro-life advocacy in our fight against contraception, abortion, euthanasia, etc. Again, pardon me for uh, quoting lengthily from Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. Because again, it expresses very well what uh, is happening at what will happen in the Philippines if uh, House Bill uh, 4244 will be approved. Uh, the Holy Father says in Pope John for the second. Unfortunately, this disturbing state of affairs, far from decreasing, uh, is expanding, no? this uh, attack against life. With the new prospects opened up by a scientific and technological progress, there arise new forms of attacks on the dignity of the human being. At the same time, a new cultural climate is developing and taking hold, which gives crimes against life a new and if possible, even more sinister character, giving rise to further great concern. Broad sectors of public opinion justify certain crimes against life in the name of the rights of individual freedom. And on this basis, they claim not only exemption from punishment, but even authorization by the state, so that these things can be done with total freedom and indeed with the free assistance of healthcare systems. That is it, no? I mean, uh, this new one, like uh, well, contraception, abortion, euthanasia, the, there's an added evil in the sense that they are not only wrong, but they are considered right by the government, by people. And that's what makes it more, in some sense, evil. At least when people uh, torture or others or oppress, uh, they said they not give good salaries to their workers, it's wrong, and we know it's wrong. Everybody says it's wrong. But when we have abortion, euthanasia, it's wrong, but people say it's okay, it's all right. That's what makes it, I think, worse. Because sometimes people say, why are you insisting so much, the Holy Father, about this? Well, because it is something wrong in the sense that what is wrong is being considered right. And so, while about injustices to the poor, all of us will still consider it wrong, all the some are doing it, no? So, I will just continue what the Holy Father says. All this is causing a profound change in the way in which life and relationship between people are considered. The fact that legislation in many countries, perhaps even departing from basic principles of their constitutions, is determined not to punish these practices against life, and even to make them altogether legal, so both, is both a disturbing symptom and a significant cause of grave moral decline. And that's what we are trying to prevent here in our country. You know? To legalize these things and to say it's okay and even to promote them. Choices are once unanimously considered criminal and rejected by the common moral sense are gradually becoming socially acceptable. Even certain sectors of the medical profession, which way its calling is directed to the defense and care of human life, are increasingly willing to carry out these acts against the person. In this way, the very nature of the medical profession is distorted and contradicted, and the dignity of those who practice it is degraded. In such a cultural and legislative situation, the serious demographic, social, and family problems which weigh upon many of the world's peoples and which require responsible and effective attention from national and international bodies are left open to false and deceptive solutions opposed to the truth and the good of persons and nations. As uh, Governor Bandilin Garcia said last night, no? when there are problems of economy and so on, they always blame population and not corruption and not poor governance and so on. 
So that is really why the Holy Father and we, in a sense, the bishops are moving heaven and earth to stop the approval of this at House Bill 4244 because it will uh, open the floodgates for other things. And uh, uh, in the sense that the other, these other things will be considered legal and okay when they are in fact wrong. The main reason why the Catholic Church is against House Bill 4244 is the fact that it will compel the government to promote contraception and use public money, billions of, of pesos, to do so. Aside from the harmful medical effects of contraceptives, the use of contraceptives is immoral. That is against the law of God. I will not anymore elaborate why contraception is immoral. I think that has been told us many times. It is important and urgent that we stop the passage of House Bill 4244 because from the experience of other countries, once contraception is promoted by a government, approval of abortion, euthanasia, divorce, same-sex marriage follows. Approval of House Bill 4244 is like opening the floodgate to these other immoral practices. That's what we would like to uh, prevent in our country. Now, in this talk, I would like to point out that those who are moving that these immoral practices be approved by law and considered uh, rights and okay, when they are imbued by more or less the same wrong ideas and principles. They use these wrong principles to promote and justify these anti-life practices. Uh, first, uh, uh, relativism, no? relativism. What is re relativism? According to Benedict XVI, I will quote, a dictatorship of relativism is being constituted but recognizes nothing is absolute and which only leaves the eye and its whims as the ultimate measure. Relativism says that there are no universal truths which are true always and everywhere. Everything is relative. Truth depends on your situation, on the way you see things. Ultimately, it means truth is what I think is true. I have my own truth, you have your own truth. There is no truth that all must accept. Now, if everyone has his own truth, then this will lead to chaos. And there is a conflict of truths. My truth, your truth, his truth. What usually happens is that one imposes his own truth on others. Finally, this will lead to the rule of the most powerful, and that will be the end of democracy. But there is only one truth that is based on reality, which we arrive at by right reason. This truth is objective, that is conforming to reality. It's the criterion we should use to settle difference or differences when our truths are in conflict. People who subscribe to relativism say that contraception is not always evil. Whether it's moral or immoral depends on the situation or motive of the person doing it. This is against the teaching of the Church which says that contraception is intrinsic, intrinsically evil. That is, it is evil in itself, evil by its nature. No circumstance or motive can make it good. It is always evil. Now I will again quote from Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor, the splendor of truth, number 18. Reason attests that there are objects of the human act, that there are actions which are by their nature, incapable of being ordered to God because they radically contradict the good of the person made in his image. These are the acts which in the church's moral tradition have been termed intrinsically evil, intrinsically malum. They are such always and per se. In other words, 
on account of their very object and quite apart from the ulterior intentions of the one acting and the circumstances. Consequently, without in the least denying the influence on morality exercised by circumstances and especially by intentions, the Church teaches that there exist acts which per se and in themselves, independently of circumstances, are always seriously wrong by reason of their object. Now regarding contraception, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in uh, number 2370 says, Every option which, whether in anticipation of the conjugal act or in its accomplishment or in, it, or in the development of its natural consequences, proposes, whether as an end or as a means, to render procreation impossible, so this action, every action, is intrinsically evil. So, contraception is uh, intrinsically evil, by its nature evil, so it can never be good. No? So. Now, another wrong idea is the wrong notion of freedom of conscience. No? Freedom of conscience. And this is also coming here. No? Those who support House Bill 4244 say something like this, I have freedom of conscience. I have a right to follow my conscience. If I think that the teaching of the church is wrong, then I have not to follow it. Well, it's what, sometimes you hear that, no? It's a, what you call cafeteria faith, no? Or cafeteria Catholics, no? I mean, uh, like in the cantin bar, in the cafeteria, you just choose what you, what you want. So it's the same as if the church teachings are like in the cafeteria, you, you choose what you want to believe. But you know, uh, one time, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, because the first time he came, she came here, it was her escort. And we happen to speak about this, you know, about abortion and so on. And they said, we cannot just choose what we want to believe. No? If we believe in Christ, we have to believe everything that Christ teaches. And not choose among what uh, He teaches. And it's very, I think, logical, right? common sense. So that is it. And I think also this uh, pro-choice Catholics and in, in uh, in America, I think here, no, regarding the use this pro-choice regarding contraception, euthanasia, and so on. In a sense, they are like that, no. They just want to choose what they want from the teachings of the Catholic Church. They don't want to really believe in Christ fully, no? and that is not faith. That's not real faith. No? Now, I would like to give you a little class about conscience, no. Conscience is defined as the practical judgment of reason upon an individual act as good and to be, and to be performed or as evil and to be avoided. There are two levels of conscience. You know? That is, this is what I learned when I was a seminarian. You know? uh, a, you know, what we call synderesis. This is the knowledge of the first general principles of morality. Like do good, and avoid evil, do not kill, etc., on which we base our judgment on the goodness or evilness of individual acts. According to St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 2, uh, verse 14 to 15, and St. Basil, these first principles of morality have been implanted by God on our hearts. So, they are there already. It's in our nature, in our hearts, no? Now, conscience in the strict sense. As already expressed above, this is the practical judgment of reason upon an individual act as good and to be performed or as evil and to be avoided. Conscience in the strict sense applies our basic knowledge of the general moral principles that is in their sense, to a particular situation to an individual act. Now, freedom of conscience does not mean that we have the right to decide on the goodness or evilness of an act in any way we like. Freedom is not the right to do whatever we like. Freedom is the right to do what we ought. What we ought to do is linked to what is true 
and to what is good. No? So freedom of conscience is the right to decide in accordance with what is true and what is good. No? Freedom of conscience doesn't mean that you can decide any way you like against what is good, against what is true. No? Freedom of conscience includes the obligation to do our best to have a correct conscience. That is a conscience that is conforming to the truth. A conscience that does not run counter to what is good. It is true that we have the obligation to follow what our conscience tells us before we act. No? Conscience is a proximate norm of morality. So before we act, just before we act, we have to follow what our conscience tells us. On the other hand, we also have the obligation to try our best to have a correct conscience. No? That is also our obligation. For us Catholics, as members of the Catholic Church, we believe in faith that the correct conscience is one that is in conformity with the teaching of the Church, with the moral teaching of the Magisterium. Now the U.S. Conference of Bishops said something like this in their statement on responsibilities of Catholics in public life. They said that, uh, as members of the Church, all Catholics are obliged to shape our consciences in accordance with the moral teaching of the Church. That's what the Catholic bishops say now. Now, the Magisterium is the teaching authority of the Church. It is composed of the Pope and the bishops. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ told Peter and the Apostles that we believe what our Lord Jesus Christ told Peter and the Apostles. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. That is in Luke chapter 10 verse 16. And Christ also said, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. That is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. The popes and the bishops are the successors of Peter and the apostles. So we can say to the reject the Pope and the bishops, teaching is also to, the, to reject Christ. No? Now again, uh, Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor says something like this. The Church puts herself always and only at the service of conscience, helping it to avoid being tossed to and fro the every wind of doctrine proposed by human deceit, and helping it not to swerve from the truth about the good of man, but rather especially in more difficult questions to attain the truth with certainty and to abide in it. So this uh, false notion of freedom of conscience is already coming here, no? especially among our intellectual Catholics. No? So one time, there was a time when I was uh, vice chairman of the bishops' businessmen conference, representing the bishops. And so we have uh, one of the big officers there was wanting to introduce to this uh, the bill of the man, no? And, uh, uh, as if uh, fav uh, favoring it, something like that. Uh, I was telling him, he said, uh, you know, uh, I think as Catholics, we have to follow what the bishops are saying, you know, what the church uh, the, are uh, saying. The bishop, the bishops' conference are against this uh, House Bill uh, 4244. But they said, uh, Bishop, we have freedom of conscience. We can do what uh, our conscience uh, tells us. And he is a graduate of one of our big um, prestige schools, the Catholic schools. But I said, we, we have to follow the church. 
And they said, you know, Bishop, if the church will always uh, insist on the teachings, on her teachings, you will, you will, the church will lose many uh, what, members, will lose many faithful. Well, I said, uh, you know, Christ himself has been crucified by people. But she, he went on teaching what is right. And then he told them, but Bishop, how are you sure that the teachings of the church are the teachings of Christ? And I, I was really, I almost fell off my chair. I said, yes, a graduate of, uh, I will not tell you about the school because they might get angry with me, you know. Uh, and, uh, I, don't know. I don't know. I remember of the Bishop, Businessman Conference of the Philippines. They're supposed to, uh, if you remember them, the Bishop, Businessman Conference. I mean, you're supposed to, uh, well, abide with what uh, the church is saying, what the bishop was saying, so I, I was really, uh, well, that's why it's already coming, it's already coming, so. And these are the principles they used to, well, why they, we have a freedom to do what we like, so, uh, okay. Now, uh, third is uh, secularism. I want to say this because I think these are the, attitude, the principles that are behind people who are in favor of this, even Catholics, you know, of, in favor of House Bill 42-44. Now, secularism. In simple words, it means that religion, God, or the church, has no place in public life, in government, in laws, in public education, in public debates, etc. Religion is a private affair. It should limit itself to the sacristy. And this is already true in Europe and in the United States. Very much. For example, in the U.S., there are some states there which do not use anymore the word Christmas because the word Christ is there. They want only to use winter holidays. So what do you... What, what do you prepare uh, uh, celebrate winter holidays? We uh, celebrate Christmas because it's the birth of Christ, no? Not because it's winter, no? And that's how it becomes, uh, I mean, it will amount to, no? Then they don't have prayer in the classrooms, it's prohibited. In public uh, schools, it's really prohibited. They have even taken away uh, the you know, Ten Commandments in some public offices. No? And, well, of course, the cross also. In fact, uh, uh, I don't know if it actually happened. No? It's a kind of uh, uh, joke. They said that uh, in one uh, public school in the U.S., uh, for the graduation, the class, uh, the graduating class was taught. Uh, and the speakers from that class, the valedictorian, the salutatorian, could never mention God in your valedictory a speech. No? I said the class did not like that. No? I said, why, why, why? But that was the rule. Secretarism. So when the valedictorian was giving his uh, speech, and the background here is, in, is it not that in the United States, when somebody will sneeze, they say, God bless you. No? So, sneeze. so when the valedictorian was uh, giving his speech, intentionally he sneezed. And the whole class said, God bless you. So nobody was able to stop the mentioning of God um, during the valedictory speech. But so it can amount to, no? I mean, uh, well, it's, everything is impoverished. No? Even expressions like God bless you, I mean, you sneeze, of well, uh, Now, I just would like to know. Many of those who support House Bill 4244 are basing themselves on this intolerant secularism. They say that the church has no right to participate in the making of laws of government because of the principle of the separation of church and state. This principle actually means that the state has no right to intervene into the beliefs and doctrines of any religious denomination and that the state should not have an official religion as they say, state religion. 
It also means that the state should not favor one religion over another. But the Philippine Constitution does not prohibit any group of citizens, civic or religious, to express, promote, or campaign so that their views on what is good for the country and for the individual person be accepted by society and have an influence on the laws of the country, on the life of the, of the country. If atheists can, why not those who believe in God? The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in its doctrinal note regarding the participation of Catholics in political life tells us that all citizens, including Catholics, have the right to base their contribution to society and political life through the legitimate means available to everyone in a democracy, that they have a right to, to base their contribution to society and political life on their particular understanding of the human person and the common good. So any group has that right now. It says further, it is not part of the church's task to set forth specific political solutions and even less to propose a single solution as the acceptable one to temporal questions that God has left to the free and responsible judgment of each person. So in one part, the, the Vatican also says, of course, regarding uh, temporal questions, of course, it's not any more part of the uh, task of the church to give uh, solutions. You know? and say that this is the only acceptable solution that is left to the lay people because that is their field. No? Uh, here, as a, um, uh, sometimes, when, uh, my, in my opinion is that uh, sometimes I read in the newspapers some of our priests giving self solutions to temporal problems of the government. I think it's not part anymore of our, of our uh, mission as, uh, as priests. No? And the church says that's not anymore our part of our task. No? Every Catholic, every layman in uh, government is free to choose what he thinks is the best uh, economic or temporal program. For example, no? uh, whether what is best for the Philippines, uh, unitary <laughs> system of government or federal. No? I think it's not part anymore of us priests to say it should be unitary, presidential or it will be federal. You have to leave that to the experts now. On the other hand, no? this however the church's right and duty to provide a moral judgment on temporal matters when this is required by faith or the moral law. But uh, uh, when uh, faith and the moral law no? requires uh, us to speak when uh, something in government, temporal matters, is involving already faith and the moral law and the salvation of souls, then the church has the right to speak about it. Man cannot be separated from God, nor politics or governance from morality. Our Christian faith gives us the true meaning of man and our world. It provides a firm foundation for the duty to respect the dignity of man and his basic rights, and a firm foundation for the duty to contribute to the common good. For us Christians, every man has to be respected and loved because he was created in the image of God and called to be a child of God, participating in God's own life. In history, many regimes or governments that rejected God in their laws and policies ended disastrously. We can cite the regime of Hitler and the Nazis, the totalitarianism and racism, and that of Stalin, no? atheistic communism, Marxism, that ended up in the murder of millions due to the lack of respect for the dignity of the human person. The rejection of God, the Creator, and the giver led to the rejection of the dignity of every human person. 
Senator Adlai Stevenson, a former candidate for president in the United States, said, Communism is a corruption of a dream of justice. Because if you reject that uh, belief that there is a God who created us and who is the lawgiver, because if we accept that there is a God who created us, then uh, God is, uh, gives us a law which is founded on our nature which He created. And that law that God gives us in its accordance with our nature. And it's for the good of ourselves. No? Uh, before I, when I was a seminarian, we had plenty of Latin. No? In fact, our textbook in philosophy were in Latin. And there is a principle in, uh, I think, uh, moral philosophy in ethics, which sounds like this. Agere sequitur esse. No? No, action follows the aim. If you are a human being, you must behave like a human being. Your behavior, your action must be human. And that is the, kung sa Tagalog, kung tao ka, magpakatao ka. Magka magpakababoy, you know? Magka magpakahayop. You have to act according to your nature. And law is founded on that, no? So, God who made our nature is also the lawgiver. And we have to accept that. Because if we don't accept an objective law, then what happens is the one governing, the most powerful is the one who determines what is good and what is bad. And if you accept that God created us and the law that He gives is in accordance with our nature because He knows us, He knows what is best for us, that the law that He gives is for our own good, then we have to respect that law and not just make laws the way we want. And that's what happened to Stalin and uh, Hitler and all these things, and all those uh, regimes that rejected God. Now here it's good to quote Benedict XVI in his book, Jesus of Nazareth. It was about the first temptation of Jesus, no? If you are a God, make this stone, make, change this stone into bread. And uh, our Lord said, man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he has some explanations. This is what he says. The German Jesuit Alfred Depp was executed by the Nazis once wrote, Bread is important, but for man, freedom is more important. But for man, but most important of all is unbroken fidelity and faithful adoration of God. So he experienced that when he was uh, imprisoned and executed by the Nazis. Now, Benedict XVI says, When this ordering of goods is no longer respected, that God is first, no? but turned on its head, the result is not justice or concern for human suffering. The result is rather ruin and destruction, even of material goods themselves. When God is regarded as a secondary matter that can be set aside temporarily or permanently on account of more important things, it is precisely these supposedly more important things that come to nothing. It is not just the negative outcome of the Marxist experiment that proves this. So that was proven in Russia in the Marxist countries, they rejected but but the ones they would like to protect the economy and all this, they also were, uh, uh, they also suffered, they also were so destroyed. And then they said, the issue is the primacy of God. The issue is acknowledging that He is a reality. That He is the reality without which nothing else can be good. And that is what secularism is trying to, to take away. Why include God here? No? It's not a reality. The issue is acknowledging that He is a reality. That He is the reality without which nothing else can be good. History cannot be detached from God and then run smoothly on purely material lines. If man's heart is not good, then nothing else can turn out good either. I think it's true, no? 
if our hearts are not good, nothing can never also be turned out to be good. And the goodness of the human heart can ultimately come only from the one who is goodness, who is the good itself um, from God. And goodness only come from God. We need God to remain good. No? Now the last, no? I'm about to end. I hope you'll be happy I'm about to end. <laughs> I have already expressed this before, but I will just uh, repeat it. The false notion of pluralism or religious freedom. The first notion of pluralism or religious freedom. One of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why the Catholic Church is against the House Bill 4244, Reproductive Health Bill or Responsible Parenthood Bill, is that the bill directs the government to promote contraception and to give free contraceptives to people. According to a columnist in the Philippine Daily Inquirer, this opposition of the church is against religious freedom. He says that because of religious freedom, the state should not prevent people from practicing responsible parenthood according to their beliefs. There may churchmen compel President Aquino, by whatever means, to prevent people from acting according to their religious belief. First of all, by opposing the RH bill, the Catholic Church is not moving for the ban of contraceptives, the non-abortive patient wants, although she would be happy if these contraceptives are banned. At present, in the Philippines, anyone can buy contraceptives from drug stores and even from some convenience stores, like 7-Eleven and even in these stores in this uh, uh, Catholic Station in Manila, Shell, all this, Select, and all this. But the church is against, I repeat, you can buy condoms there, no? What the church is against, I repeat, is that government should promote contraception and provide free contraceptives to people. Therefore, it is wrong to say that the church wants the government to prevent people from practicing responsible parenthood according to their religious belief. <laughs> and that the Catholic Churchmen are compelling President Aquino by whatever means to prevent people from acting according to their religious beliefs. What the Church does is to try to convince President Aquino and our senators and congressmen not to enact a law that directs the government to promote contraception and provide free contraceptives to people. It's also good to point out that the church teaching regarding contraceptives is not based on faith or revelation, although it is confirmed by our faith. The church teaching is based on natural law, which we know through natural reason. By studying through correct reasoning the nature of the human person, we arrive at this teaching regarding contraception. All human beings, Catholic or not, are obliged to act according to right reason. By the efforts of the Church to go against the RH bill, the Church is not imposing her religious beliefs on others. She is trying to stop a bill which is against natural law, a law which all human beings, Catholic or not, should follow. The RH bill, judged from the principles of natural law, is against the good of the human person and the common good. The Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith in its doctrinal note regarding the participation of Catholics in public life tells us that all citizens, including Catholics, have the right to base their contribution to society and political life on their particular understanding of the human person and the common good, and as long as they use legitimate means. In a democracy, any group of citizens has the right to campaign and lobby so that what they consider to be good for the country are enacted into law and what they deem to be harmful for the country are not enacted into law. Now if people who are in favor of a mother's milk would like to have a law prohibiting can milk, if they can do that, 
Well, why can't we not have also a campaign that, uh, you know, contraceptives should not be allowed? If there are people who would like to pass a law that prohibits uh, smoking, no? Smoking in uh, restaurants, buses, and everywhere, everybody has a right to campaign and to lobby for that. The columnist, the columnist says further in this column that we live in a pluralist society. This is true and therefore we should respect the beliefs and opinions of others. But there is a limit to this pluralism. No? Pluralism means plural. They are not singular, not only one belief, but many beliefs. And we have to respect that. No? But there is a limit to this pluralism. We cannot accept an ethical pluralism which ignores the principles of natural ethics and yield to ephemeral cultural moral trends, as if every outlook on life were of equal value. Because if a group of people believe that uh, murder is right, well, we have not to respect that, it's wrong. It's against natural law. The columnist also quotes the compendium on the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Because of its historical and cultural ties to a nation, a religious community might be given special recognition on the part of the state. Such recognition must in no way create discrimination within the civil or social order for other religious groups. And those responsible for government are required to interpret the common good of their country not only according to the guidelines of the majority, but also according to the effective good of all the members of the community, including the minority. The Church, by opposing House Bill 4244, is interpreting the common good of the country not only according to the guidelines of the majority, but also according to the effective good of all the members of the community including the minority. In opposing the bill, the Church is interpreting the common good according to the guidance of natural law, which is valid for all, the minority as well as the majority. Benedict XVI says that natural law must be the foundation of democracy, so that those in power are not given the chance to determine what is good or evil. Regarding freedom, Benedict XVI said in his address to the International Congress on Natural Law, yet taking into account that human freedom is always a freedom shared with others, it is clear that the harmony of freedom can be found only in what is common to all, the truth of the human being, the fundamental message of being itself, exactly the lex naturalis or the natural law. So it is urgent that we fight against these false ideas and principles. They are used by people as the justification for the promotion of the anti-life bill. Because of these ideas, they exclude morality in the making of laws. They only consider what is utilitarian or convenient as a criterion in making laws. So never mind God, let us just seek what is useful, what is convenient for us. These ideas are already prevalent in Europe and in the United States. They are coming to the Philippines. No? We have so many. We have these uh, uh, Catholics who are you know, uh, free thinkers, something like that, in a shelter and all these, openly attacking the church, uh, Catholics for love, for choice, and all this. So we have really to do something about it, but they said to stop it at the beginning. So let us pray and work hard that these ideas will not be accepted by our people. So thank you for listening.